Hello, everyone. Welcome to North and South Podcasts. Follow me on Twitter at North Podcast. And if you can contribute via coffee, please share, spread the word, do all the good things that people do. Right, it's my honour to have the first person who's come back on to the podcast and who hasn't been scared away, and that is the legend, local writer, creative teacher, educator, trade unionist, David Moorhead. David, how are you? I'm very good, and thank you for having me back. Most people <laughs> might not want to hear me again, so thank well, you very much. Pleasure is all mine, and I'm sure our listeners as well. Uh, we're going to have a little chat today. We're going to try and keep it shortish, um, but we're going to just have a little chat about our favourite books. So this is about creativity and tapping in your, into your creativity. But obviously, we get a lot of inspiration from books. But I just want to talk about your excellent play, Forgotten Voices, which I've only watched um, through the internet. It's going on a tour. So what's the latest with Forgotten Voices? Yeah, really, really excited that um, in October, Black History Month, um, we're going to take Forgotten Voices on tour in the UK. It's the story of my grandmother. She was a woman of colour in South Africa. Uh, She um, fought against racism and sexism. She was married to Clements Kadali, who is the first national black trade union leader of South Africa. So for 30 years, they were pioneers in equal rights and they paved the way for Mandela. He, Clements Kadali, has a statue um, and uh, is remembered History is totally forgotten, my grandmother, and hence the title of the play, Forgotten Voices. It's her story. Uh, Charissa Valentine is a brilliant actress. It's a one-woman play. It's really, really good. I know I'm boasting now because I wrote it, but it's great. We're on tour. We begin in Birmingham, the Crescent Theatre. Then we're going to Manchester Cathedral. We've been asked to perform there, um, and that's going to be amazing. Then we're... uh, off to the Lake District um, to Theatre by the Lake. And then we're in Cambridge. And then we're at London for the Canal Cafe Theatre. And then we come back to um, Merseyside to the fabulous new theatre, which is the uh, Playhouse North, the Shakespeare one that's opening in Prescott. And we are part of their opening season. Brilliant. Sorry, I actually went to uh, Prescott recently and saw that theatre. I couldn't believe how big it was. And I spoke about it a couple of podcasts ago. So I'm going to go to one of those productions at that theatre. Um, that's great. And we'll put details in the notes about that play. But it is a great play. And I enjoyed watching it. And um, the more people that go and see it, the better. Because as you say, you know, history, there's a lot of people in history who, you know, never really get the limelight. And I think it's a very, very important story. And I know that... We've spoken about this in the earlier podcast. I think it's podcast nine. So check that out, folks, about Forgotten Voices. It is a great play. So, David, we know you're a big creative. Uh, what are you reading at the moment, fiction, nonfiction? I am I'm reading um, The Inheritance Games. Um, it's a YA book um, by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. And the reason I'm reading it is I'm currently writing a children's novel so I'm just keeping myself up to date but the premise of this is that this poor girl in America 18 year old um, suddenly inherits 42 billion dollars um, from a man she doesn't know and and she's got to move in with the family who've all been disinherited and live with them for a year so they hate her. She has no idea why she's suddenly this media target. And with 42 billion at stake, the stakes are very high. I think it's Hunger Games with your relatives. <laughs> it's, very, it's very enjoyable. I've just finished reading for the first time Harry Potter, which I really enjoyed. Excellent. Yeah, I um, I read a bit of the first Harry Potter book and I thought... This is good, but it's not really for me. But people have told me that particularly some of the later books are so in-depth. I mean, yes. the, the huge tomes, aren't they? And they have, people have said to me that I'm missing a treat with, um, you know, we're not reading Harry Potter. But uh, that first book as well sounds very, very interesting. Have you finished that first book yet? Or you're halfway no, through? no, I've just, I just started it yesterday. 
Yeah. I should finish it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's good. I mean, I've, I've my son is nearly three, and uh, I would say that my ability to to spend time reading books is diminished. But I always have to have a book or two on the go, even if it's slow progress. And um, I'm just reading a, a history book actually by Tony Judd with Timothy Snyder and Tony Judd is a historian. He, he died a few years ago. Timothy Snyder is um, a political, a historical political writer who warns about tyranny. And basically it's a series of discussions that they had when Tony Judd was approaching death about the 20th century. So they talk about the Jewish experience. They talk about um, the history of the left and it's phenomenally, phenomenally intellectual, insightful, and just gets me really, really thinking about things at a level that I've never experienced before with a history book. So Tony Judd with Timothy Snyder, Thinking the 20th Century, absolutely brilliant. But I just finished another great book called The Short History of Germany by James Hawes, which for me is a short history book that's a summary, but that doesn't shy away from analysis. And it uses like picture sources and diagrams and stuff to, to show and, and like mind maps. I've never seen those used in, in history books before, but two fantastic books, which I, one I'm reading still and the other one I finished recently. But I do love my history and I do think that this is going to sound controversial, but one of my favourite books ever, and usually people refer to novels when they say their favourite book, is... The Hundred Years' War by Jonathan Sumption. Now, Jonathan Sumption used to be on the the Supreme Court, the UK Supreme oh, Court. I, it, I forget if it's called the Supreme Court in this country now. My mind's gone blank. But he was a judge on there, very intelligent, but I've never known anyone to write such beautiful narrative history. And I think there is a very important storytelling dimension to history, which we often neglect in academic circles, as it were, but beautifully readable. And he's done four volumes so far. Each of them are about 800 pages. And uh, the fifth one is currently being written. But I do find history books, I find it very hard to read a dry fact orientated purely about the academia type of history. But I think very much the way it's expressed, the facts and the information, I find that really, really important uh, in good history books, etc. But um, Anyway, that's my little spiel on, on history. I think it, it needs to be written well, but it also needs to be challenging. I wouldn't say the Tony Judd book is an easy book to read because every paragraph I'm going, whoa. <laughs> but um, it's certainly very, very rewarding. I, I was interested in something you said recently about when you were reading a book I recommended to you by Donna Tart, The Secret History. And I think you said you were just enjoying every sentence. And yeah, I it's so much nice say, to get in a book, isn't it? I would say um, one of my favourite books of all time, right, is The Secret History by Donna Tartt. Yeah. Um, and it's my favourite because of the writing style. I always say it's the equivalent of eating chocolate, <laughs> where you don't want the, the chocolate to go. So yeah. you just sat there enjoying it. So you do... You don't care that you're going slowly through the book. You just, her her expressions, her literary style is just so, so beautiful. But she does write nine hours a day for eight years to produce that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, yeah. you can tell it's just, mm. it's just wonderful. Yeah, I think some writers, you can tell that they're put, not only are they putting time into it, but they're putting a bit of themselves into it. It's almost like, you know that thing they say that it, although oxygen is what we need to live, it's the oxygen that slowly kills you. It wears your cells down. And um, whenever I've read the Donna Tart but novel, I've read uh, The Goldfinch as well. And I read, is it My Little Friend, the other one? Um, she put so much into it. I've, there's such scale and depth to the books. It's just beggar's belief. But you can tell she's put a lot into it. But I think the rewards are there for all to see. She obviously edits it a lot and thinks about it a lot as well. But The Secret History, my mate gave me that and said, read this. And I had it on the shelf for about two years. And then I picked it up and just 
just absolutely brilliant. And I read a recently a, a York Notes equivalent called Continuum Classics Review of the Secret History. I don't know if I lent it to you, actually, but that was like an analysis of it. And it's just great to see an analysis of a book that you've read, just to see what different people say and think about it. But uh, The Secret History is just a, a phenomenal book. It's like a thriller, isn't it? But an intellectual thriller and a deeply yeah. psychological thriller that just resonates. Every, I think Chekhov was one of the, the, the best at this. When you describe a situation that someone else is going through, when you think, oh, yeah, I don't know exactly what they mean, even though that situation isn't something you've been through, they relate it to you in such a way that you just identify with it and you're there. And as you say, I, I, I just loved every sentence of that book. Absolutely loved it. I think all good books take you into a different world and you are living there all the time. You, and you really understand the characters yeah. and your heart is beating constantly throughout the whole book because you are on edge. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's just ideas and society and people and their values. And it's just like an explosion. And you're just so, it, it's just reading is one of the most beautiful things on this planet. Absolutely. And I think if you think about where, writing came from the ability to convey a message across time you know tell old stories i mean i believe like homer the iliad the odyssey they don't know, actually know whether it was one or through wrote it but that this is like a great story that has been passed through time and then someone says right let's put it down and i know where uh, some people say that about you know the key stories of religion old stories they, they, they get passed on and then someone says right we need to capture these in a book but there is a grandiosity about storytelling and uh, almost a transcendence, like a religious aspect, a, a beauty to, to good storytelling that it takes you to another time and place. And I think it's beautiful the way that the secret history is written. And it's, it's a real art, isn't it, to capture that in a, in a book? Also, another one I've re I read recently, which was, has been on my to-read list for decades, was George Eliot's Middlemarch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think is probably one of the greatest novels of all time. Yeah. Um, Mid is, Middlemarch is a town, and it's set in 1832, and she explores the attitudes of the town to uh, medicine, to women, to religion, to foreigners, to politics. And it's just full of great characters, superb observations. Right. She has just sat back. But the thing I kept thinking was that George Eliot was living in Crosby in 2020 because we hadn't changed much. Yeah. And that was just like, wow, how, how science is treated in 1832. And then you contrast it to... Uh, COVID and how people were responding and and you can just see the parallels all the time that we don't really in one sense move on yeah yeah that human nature it's, it's interesting isn't it because I was um I've heard people like I've seen people on social media say yeah uh, like things about COVID or whatever like you know like the weird and I go I just google it and find an article and go, okay, that answers that question. I'll just send it to them. But I think we're all guilty sometimes of latching on to oversimplistic narratives. And mm -hmm. there's, a, there's been a lot of criticism of people like Foucault, uh, et cetera, for saying that, oh, they try to reduce everything to this relativism that everything is interpreted, et cetera. And I get that. But one of the things that the Foucault is important for is he said, you need to question everything and you do need to like say what's going on here. That is important, but there are facts and there is due diligence that people need to do about, you know, what information they access, etc. And I think that like studying like history and you, you read about um, Samuel Pepys, you know, his observations of Londoners during the, the plague and how they behaved. And you look at like the witch trials. Oh, there's a woman who's a bit weird, mental health problems, talks to herself. Oh, she's a witch. And we know what happened yeah. through history with the witch trials. 
And during COVID, there was a lot of nonsense floating around. And I remember thinking, like, this is just, it's like we've learned nothing. Do you know what I mean? And that's why history is important. That's why literature is important. And that's why understanding human nature is important. I think with Middlemarch, if you read that, you understand the British um, identity. Yeah. with all its quirks and everything. So sometimes you think, why do they do that? Why do they respond that way? Even like, why did Brexit happen the way it did? Yeah. But it's all in middle March. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And yeah. I'm thinking, no, this, she, she's observed it all. She's presented it. And she said, this is why they have this view of, on medicine or on foreigners, etc. And you're thinking, yeah, but that was back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. It's brilliant, isn't it? But I think that's what great books do. The the access to Zeitgeist at the time and the identify the universality of things. Um, I, I heard it once said that, like, if you read War and Peace by Tolstoy, and I might be wrong, actually, it might be Dostoevsky, one of his novels. It's got everything in there. <laughs> everything that's ever happened is in this book. And when you read it, I mean, that's another time and place you can read it and go, wow, this guy really observed human nature and got to the heart of it. And, um, you know, I I, I think that that's wonderful. But I think what great authors do as well is, what, you know, Elias has done is looked at human nature and said, right, people now don't really notice what's going on around them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just observe what these things are somewhat objectively and try and capture them in a book. And then it just produces something which is just absolutely beautiful. It's like his reality observed from just here. And I mean, I've read books and thought, oh my God, that's something I've experienced. And someone like, I never knew other people experienced that. And this person has just captured it in a book. Uh, I just think that's beautiful. Um, have you ever read any of um, Joyce? I, I, I've tried to read Joyce, James Joyce, a few times, oh and my. I've really struggled. No, it's on my it's on my to do yeah, list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, yeah. I think that's a similar kind of thing because yeah. I think with Joyce is he writes as people experience reality, which therefore makes it tough to read, but. Beautiful, and I, I, I've tried starting a few times, but it's a big book. I think, like when I'm older or I've got a bit more time, I'll try and get round to it. But and the I, the other one is is to do it on, on as an audio book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good because point. Because yeah. the the actors, um, their their skills, their their creativity, their response to it, um, lifts as well. Because I yeah, always have a yeah. book on audio, and I'm reading as well. So do you actually, sorry, listen to it and read at the same time? Yes. That's a really good way of persevering with a a book that's maybe difficult to access, isn't it? Because I can say with Middlemarch, um, and I choose the narrator, Juliet Aubrey was just superb. The voices, the tone, it was so rich what she brought to the book that allowed me to access it, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. phenomenal, isn't it? Um, have you read any David Mitchell? You know, the author, I think he was from Southport originally. I, th- I think I've mentioned it to you before about his books. He, um, he writes novels. His most famous is Cloud Atlas. And it's uh, a very ambitious book that has, I think it's six stories in it. And he starts with a story that then leads into another one into another one, into another one, into mm. another one. And then there's a big long story in the middle and then it goes back in reverse order. So oh, you actually nice. finish the novel with the first story and it all links together. And then what he did later on, I don't think, I don't know whether he intended to, to do this when he first start, started this. He linked about six novels together across time and space, which is very ambitious. And then took a huge risk in a book called The Bone Clocks, which officially tied it all together. And now he's gone off and, and started writing something different. But David, um, not to be confused with the comedian, uh, David Mitchell, oh, yes. um, yeah. but he is just absolutely sensational. And I don't think I've ever really read anyone like that. And there was a, I heard a, a 
program on Radio 4 discussing it a few years ago, which was very insightful to hear, like a book that you really, really like discussed. But that book, it was turned into a film which wasn't that much of a success, but I do think it was quite a good a good attempt at the book because the book mm. is so complex. But that book is just, again, there's characters who was it's like 500 years in the future or whatever in one of the stories. And it's like you're there and he's describing your life now. And that ability to do that within each sentence, I think, is powerful. And, also, uh, when I think he when he won an award, he thanked Jonathan Pegg, who was his agent. Yeah. At Curtis Brown. And I think Jonathan Pegg pushed for that storytelling because yeah. it's so risky because the um selling team would be saying, how, how do we market this product? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's really good that there are agents out there now who take on quite difficult stories, but yeah. enrich the whole process. Yeah, I think that's very important. Um, but David Mitchell's books, they're also, I think it came quite high up, Cloud Atlas, in books that you start that you don't finish. Because each of the stories starts, particularly the first one, it takes you 15 pages before you learn the style of the writing because it's written in like slang and colloquialisms and, and, and thought patterns because it's in the first person. Um, another book that was challenging to begin with is Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess because it, they talk in a, a strange language that's similar to English but slightly different. And then after about 20, 30 pages, you're used to it, and then you understand the rest of the book. And it's, a, it, again, huge risk-taking, but when you get into it, it's so rewarding. And I do worry about the, the used to call it the MTV generation, now you call it like the, the internet generation, where attention spans are so short. And I've noticed it myself in my ability to focus on something. Yeah. Um, I do feel people miss these treasures when they don't like properly give something a chance, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I know that you say that you've got the audio book as well as the book to read. That's a good disciplinary method yeah. as well. But I, th I think uh, young, young people as well, it is their attention spans are shorter, but they're still reading. On TikTok, there's mm. BookTok, and that has been phenomenal in, mm. in promoting uh, writing from a, from a diverse range of authors. Um, but I think now storytelling, it has to be probably more dramatic and more focused than, say, 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. it's it's not so much people aren't reading, or um, but the way we tell stories now is it, going to be different because it's going to match our psyche. Yeah. But yeah, one yeah. I did find uh, recently as well was The Well of Loneliness, by Radcliffe Hall, which is probably the ultimate lesbian novel. Um, the main character in it is absolutely wonderful. It's set just before the First World War. She won't marry, she won't settle, she won't compromise. Even though her mother is forcing her into a relationship, she wants to be a lesbian in a society where it's just not acceptable and she, she becomes an outsider. In the First World War, she drives an ambulance. She is just this fantastic, fantastic um, heroine mm. who finds love as well. Um, it came out in 1928, and then the uh, Sunday Express tried to ban it, and they put so much pressure on the Home Secretary that he banned it for... Um, 20 years and it came back out in 1948 so that's the toxic press and the government banning a female voice and the reason it was banned was that she wanted to love another woman yeah i mean it was a similar story where um dh lawrence's book um you're going to tell me what it's called now where uh, a woman a middle class woman has an affair with her servants. I forget what it's called. Lady Chatterley's Lover. Lady Chatterley's Lover. And that, that was banned because, you know, it was okay for people to live in hovels and, you know, for soldiers to be unfit to fight in the Boer War. But any book that depicted people across different class groups being yeah. intimate and a book about a woman who liked other women, you know, that, that was... Um, 
you know, so that was unacceptable. We, you know, we've we've come so far because there are more LGB, LGBT books out there now. Yeah, with yeah, more, yeah, yeah. And more authors, and you know, that's great. Yeah. But it, 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 the Well of Lonelies is a superb book. Yeah, yeah. You know, I re really thought that was great. And who, who's the author, sorry? Radcliffe Hall, who I think had died by the time um, it got unbanned, which is a great shame. That's absolutely fantastic, though, to, to think that someone could write such a novel. That as well is that her dog is called David. That's <laughs> 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 just added to it all. Yeah. That'd be funny, you know. You don't hear, you know, if you're over on the field, you don't get many dogs called David these days. No. You know, they need to bring those kind of names back. Um, so, in terms of great books, uh, you know, it's I, I find it hard to say, oh, that's the, the the best book I've ever read. I can usually come up with a bit of a short list, but I did once read a book by John Files called The Magus, and John Files is mainly known for is it the lieutenant's French wife. Lieutenant. Yeah, and the mega someone gave me that and went read this, you know, and I went yeah. I had it for again, I had it for two years, and then I read it, and I remember getting home from work on a Friday, saying I've got to read that book, and I remember on a Saturday, you know, I, I would read for maybe twenty minutes, half an hour, and then I'd have to walk the dogs, and it was a Saturday afternoon. I was just sat at the kitchen table just reading this book for hours. Again, it, it was made into a film with Michael Caine, which. It's almost a cliche that the, the book's better than the film, but I think certain books just they're, they're of such a scale that getting it in, onto a, a screen is impossible. I think it was the same with Bonfire of the Vanities by Tom Wolfe, which was turned into a film. Again, unbelievable book about human nature and capturing what people are like, but um, just didn't make it to the screen. But The Magus by John Files, um, it's a bit of a... It's a thriller and a mystery. And as it unravels on the page, I just, I was just absolutely spellbound. But two friends of mine read it at the same time and we were just messaging each other going, whoa, I, I, where are you up to? And I said, uh, like, page three, oh, just wait, you know. <laughs> so we had three of us reading at the same time. And um, that book was just... I don't know, I, I find it hard to explain how good it was. But it's the kind of book you can only read once because there's a revelation the element to it that you could never, ever... I mean, I, I would struggle to read it again. Maybe, I, maybe I'll try one day, but fantastic book. Mm -hmm. Fantastic book that, by, uh, by John Files. I've got two that I would say are near my all-time favourites, right? apart from Middlemarch, is uh, Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I just thought that was just phenomenal in terms of his storytelling, his the language. It was just magical realism yeah. and how he presented all the characters, but also how he told the history of um, India's independence and subsequent years. Yeah. And I felt so ignorant that I didn't know any of that. It hadn't been yeah. taught to me in school. I hadn't come across it. I didn't understand the Pakistan-Indian War yeah. of the early 70s and the late 60s, but it, it was just a phenomenal, phenomenal read. And it's about two children who are born at the stroke of midnight when India becomes independent in 1947. And I was reading it, and the baby was just about to be born, and the Tesco delivery arrived. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not taking food in. I just want to keep <laughs> reading, reading, go away. <laughs> That's it. Uh, it's special though when you're reading a book like that where any interruption, you're like, no. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and the other one, if I can pronounce it properly, is the Ragged Trouser uh, Philanthropists. Oh, um, yeah, I've read it. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. That, I think that changed my whole outlook on labour and work and unions and exploiting the work, you know, the proletariat, the bourgeoisie. But it's a brilliant, brilliant read. And yeah. I was just spellbound by that. It's quite a depressing read. 
It is, yeah, yeah. I um, I, uh, I found uh, that book amazing. He's buried, you know, not far from from yeah. here. Um, he died of yeah. was a TB or before he was meant to go away. But apparently, he was a he was born into like relative wealth, and then it all went. But he had genuine experiences of that life. Uh, you, Robert Tressel. So authentic and the situations are so real mm. that you think yes he must have lived mm. through all that it's about a group of painters mm. and that's all they are in a seaside town but ha- they will never liberate themselves yeah. and, and get justice because they're talented yeah. because they're just exploited by so many other people yeah. and yeah. and again yeah. i i feel that books 100 years ago Today, you can just see the same exploitation. Yeah. A few people have said that book really changed their lives and yeah. crystallised them in certain opinions. I've even spoken to someone on the right who said that's a great book about the experience of people day to day, et cetera, yeah. who may be averse to like acknowledging that like work is sometimes unpleasant. But um, that is a fantastic book. And I've never known a book dealing with such serious issues that was so funny and witty and sharp. Because apparently he wrote that, you know, and his daughter found it all and went, whoa, this is brilliant. He, he never intended to publish it. And she got it and put it all together. And, I mean, how many wonderful stories? I mean, you talk about the ancient Greeks as well and all the old plays. How much wonderful stuff has been lost to us? T- to think that that book was, was almost never published is just... Um, it just goes to show, you know, how, how much amazing stuff there is out there and how little stuff we hear about sometimes. No, ab- absolutely. And it, it, it's, it's, it's just, I often, if any of my students, when I taught, they were ever going into politics, I would buy them a copy, yeah. Yeah. you know, and just say, read this. Yeah. Because at the end of the book, no, no spoilers here, but he talks about the red sun shining over England that when there's a Labour government there will be equality for all <laughs> I think I read it as Tony Blair's Iraq war was happening <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking this is really depressing yeah I think um, I've been watching the Blair and Brown years a documentary about new Labour etc recently and I think that the Iraq war really hit a lot of people quite hard with the way it was conducted. And, um, you know, the, the idea of a, of a Labour government when ragged trousered philanthropists was written was the idea of those people out there who were the majority, there is a better time coming for you, you know what I mean? But then power comes and, you know, Labour politicians are as human as anyone else, really. But I, I do think that that book... Um, as well as it's like kind of political ambitions, it was very much, yeah, here's what the situation is. And the way he depicts like the corruption amongst the local councillors and the local landowners and some of the names he uses. And I remember like belly laughing out loud at his descriptions of the foreman. I feel like it's a crass, the foreman, the guy who's in charge of them, the guys and how cruel he is and that. At the start, it says, a very, very insightful comment. And it says Crash knew that he was getting screwed. And he knew that he was not being treated well by his bosses. And every one of the guys below hated him for how he was. They all knew that if they were in his position, they'd be exactly the same. Yeah. And his, his analysis of like how things work in human nature in that book is just absolutely brilliant. I, I echo your sentiments on that book. You know, it's a, it's a must-read book for anyone yeah. about the world of work. Just like when you get a yeah. job and you're older and all of a sudden you're not, you've not got a teacher saying, are you okay? You know? <laughs> and you're like, wait there, I'm being treated like like filthy. Yeah. And it's that book kind of captures yeah. that. Not many books do about the reality of like day-to-day life. You know, the more, yeah. if you like, challenging elements of existence like a lot of books a lot of novels a lot of art and drama it focuses on wealthy kind of backgrounds you know and uh, that think, book just is brilliant yeah i think because uh, middle class people can afford to read um because they can afford to buy the books 
right? They're, they're kind of often, there's a market of middle-class heroes. Yeah, yeah. So it reinforces a certain world where Ragged Trouser One is very, it's an unsettling read. Yeah. Because it's it's not escapism. It doesn't leave you feeling really happy. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it challenges you to the core, but it's such a, a powerful and um, perceptive examination of work then and even now, I would say. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and I think that's why Dickens was so important. I mean, you look at Dickens now, you almost say, oh, yeah, classic stories. When you read Dickens, you go, wow. I mean, the stuff he was commenting on, like, this is what's happening. And he brought that story to people right across society. And I know he did public readings as well, where people will go and hear and read, etc. And t- to get that message out there at the time, it was very unglamorous to, to write about those things, but he did it so well. And um, I often said to, like, I, I said to a mate of mine recently, I said, if, if it was to choose one book by Dickens, what would you recommend? He's, he's yet to get back to me. But have you have you read any Dickens or have you got any favourite Dickens novels? And he's not my greatest. Yeah, yeah. Writer, I loved Christmas Carol. Yeah, yeah. Right, J- just for that redemptive quality yeah. and the idea that uh, we can change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Little Dorrit, for for the love story. Yeah. And for the and 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 his characters. Um, oh, I, f- I forgot the the man who who wants to marry her, and and she says no. Yeah. But he's so it's so beautifully done. Yeah. Um, yeah. David Copperfield, Uriah Heep. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just the, Very the, these characters that 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 really um, live in your memory because they're so well created. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I think that's the, the the thing with Dickens is he he wrote about characters, but then he placed them in that kind of like social yeah. situation. So he kind of married the two, the two. If you like, because you look at Emma, I remember my uh, English literature teacher at school going, "Oh, Emma, some of the best characterization." ever. And I remember reading it for A level, thinking nothing's happening here, mate. <laughs> I'm all for great characterization in in itself, but. I think that obviously the, the narrative of the story is important. I've, I've always found it very hard to read or watch Samuel Beckett for, because of that, you know, that kind of no plot. And I, I'm all for crazy stuff. And I'm, I like I like modern art. I like left field. But for me, Beckett, I just, it's too much for me. And I don't know whether you've, you've seen much Beckett or read much Beckett, but have you got an opinion on that kind of... Because when I was at uni... I did English literature, and I remember in the first week they said, "Can you read David Copperfield?" <laughs> <laughs> so with all the freshers and everything going on, I think I got six hundred pages yeah. done and everything. But the best work I ever did at uni was on Beckett, um, and it, it was odd because um, it was Waiting for Godot, yeah, and yeah. it was the Act One. Yeah. is yeah. an act two of the play are exactly the same yeah. um, and because our lives are that, but it's hope that changes it. It's not action. Yeah. It's just that each day we get up with hope, even though we do the same things. Yeah. I think that, waiting for, for God, oh, I think that's, a, I think for me that has a little bit more to it than what was the one I saw? I saw the one where there's two, there's an old man and a son just stuck in the house talking. I just didn't like it. But I think Waiting for Godot, as you say, there's an existential dimension to Godot, which I think supersedes what, what's got actually going on, you know what I mean? And I think there's um, another one set in a restaurant yeah. with, the, yeah. with the rich Essex type, but it's like a very funny, very perceptive episode of EastEnders. <laughs> I'll have to maybe maybe I've seen and read the wrong back at them, but I know waiting for God. Oh, I've got a bit more time for that. Uh, I can't even remember what this play was called. But sorry, go on. I, I just like you know Kafka as well. You know Kafka, that kind of yeah. 
create a false situation, but explore how humans then deal with that situation. I think oh, Kafka I, has got more over political terms, yeah, doesn't it? I, his, his book, The Trial, yeah. you know, about the man who gets into the court system and he doesn't get his day in court to prove yeah. he's innocent. He just gets trapped in the system. I was working in a, in a magistrate's court in London as I read that, and I thought, good grief, this is so many of our cases. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so although it's absurd, mm. it's very true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that's how it works. Yeah. I think there's a, a lot of absurdist stuff, though, I, has a lot to say about the world and the society that we live in. And some of it's maybe a bit more explicit than others. But um, I certainly think that, like, pushing the boundaries can be very good in, in like, getting universal truths across. I saw a Sartre play a few years ago. I don't know if I watched it with you, actually. And, again, I can't even remember what it was called. But it was basically set in, like, a basement and a couch. And it was like, you know, all this mad stuff was going on. But it, was, it just said something very profound about bigger themes. And I remember thinking that was really, really good. And I was so impressed by the fact that he wrote that play and yet it was so good. You left it with such a powerful feeling of like, wow, that was brilliant. And I think that those, it, again, that's a real art because you can go a little bit too far. It, it's about just judging and gauging it uh, right. And I, I think that those that kind of... About hell. Sorry. Was that the one about hell? Yeah, it was. It was, yeah. The one about hell. Did I go with you to watch that? No, no. I but I, I remember... That, that his definition of hell was peeing with other people. <laughs> yeah, he's a bit of, <laughs> yeah, he's meant to be a bit of a uh, bit of a waffle sort of, and you know, a lot of his writings and his ideas are good. And same with Foucault, you know, people say about Foucault, oh, he, he reduces everything to interpretation. You go, yeah, but it's still useful to have your preconceptions yeah. challenged and you need to justify it. That doesn't mean it's a free-for-all and there's no truth. It just gets you thinking about things uh, a little bit more um, depth than, than maybe you did beforehand. Cool. Right, listen, we've had a little bit of a... Uh, there was no... That was a little bit of a Beckett play in itself, our chat there, wasn't it? I, I basically <laughs> said to, to folks, to David, let's talk about where you are with the play and our favourite books and great books and just want to see where it goes. So I hope... David, thanks for your time. We, we hopefully will do more of these again. What we might do in the future is maybe say, right, should we talk about this, these couple of issues just to give it a bit more kind of a, a theme, maybe? And then, um, you know, because I've got this tendency to repeat what I've said a, a few weeks before again, if I'm not careful. But uh, that was brilliant, so insightful. It's great to hear your opinions on things that I think and to hear books that you like that I might have read or not read, etc. And, um, it's great to get your insights as a writer as well. Um, everyone out there, thanks for listening. If you like this, give us a thumbs up and let us know because we, we can do more of these kind of creative podcasts because uh, I, I find them really useful for myself. And also it's a good way of finding out about great books because, you know, people have word of mouth circles, etc. But I always like, there's certain people, for example, you, David, when you tell me your book's good, I know it's good. So it's good to, to hear different opinions on things. Any final words before we go? Just uh, thank you so much for inviting me on. And it's great. I, I love reading and I love talking about books. And you are a great person to talk about books with. Uh, you give me some good recommendations as well. And then I'm going to plug the play. Um forgottenvoices.info is our website and you can book online Brilliant. Uh, but just, uh, please read it's just wonderful because you get into someone else's shoes someone else's life there are how they see the world and and you know your empathy levels increase so please read that's right and i just want to say that um i often think that reading is like traveling without moving and you can take yourself somewhere else yeah. by sitting still. And I think that that's beautiful. Um, I mean, travel broadens the mind, but the way I've read and understood books and the way I speak, I mean, speaking speak with you about books is just like meeting, you know, someone who, when we get together, just that creativity thing just goes like, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's good to be able to talk to people 
about something that I find sacred, and I think that you probably find it sacred as well. But um, good stuff. Just want to say one last thing. There's a great book about the David Irving trial, denial, right. about the Holocaust. I forget what the actual name of the original book was. Oh, is it denying the Holocaust? I'm going to grab the book because this is important. Wait there, folks. Right, the book is by Deborah E. Lipstadt, and she was taken to court by David Irving because she said that he was a Holocaust denier. And um, the original book was called Denying the Holocaust. And if you want to read a book that looks at how law works and how libel works in this country, but also how history is important and how access to the truth and the interpretation of facts is important, then yeah. you should read this book, oh, okay. particularly with this Holocaust denial thing online, which I actually, there was a book recently online on Amazon. I'm just going to finish with this point, and I know that this is a bit extra, but there was a book online recently saying, like, how the Holocaust was fabricated, and I saw it on Amazon, so I clicked on it, and what the, what's going on here? So I read the presses, and then someone underneath said, I bought this book because I wanted to know what this person had to say about the thousands of eyewitnesses. And this guy said, very stupidly said, they never even addressed it. They never said, oh, that I... And what they do, people who who believe like a perverse ideology, a conspiracy theorist, and it even happens in people's personal lives, the way that they interpret relationships, the way that people believe politically, et cetera, is you choose what you believe and nothing will kick you away from that. And all the... Uh, that book did apparently was just throw doubt upon it without actually addressing the fundamental issues and dealing with all the evidence. But it's a very good book about how anything, even such a big event like the Holocaust, can be denied, um, which ultimately is the kind of stuff that Hitler and Goebbels wanted to achieve. So they're defeated, and then people are like picking up the flame and carrying it on. But I'll just throw a final plug for that book because it's absolutely brilliant. And uh, well, there's worth anything. People denying Bosnia happened. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll lend you this if you want, Dave. Don't go out and buy it, but uh, next time I see it, I'll lend you yeah. that book. But uh, it's good for like people who are lawyers as well and for people who are interested in, particularly this modern idea of, you know, fake news and all that, uh, where, where nothing is true kind of. Um, belief that some people have. Dave, being an absolute pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your day. Hey, and uh, I'll you, stop man. recording. I'll stop recording, but we'll have a chat afterwards. Uh, everyone, have a great day and speak soon.